A bada bing bada bam. Welcome to this week's Bacon a Mystery, Bacon a Murder episode. I'm so freaking excited for this one because I did not realize the sheer amount of people that have never been mind fucked the way that I have been by the movie Shutter Island. I I thought everybody's seen this sh- Maybe everybody has. Maybe I'm mistaken. But I saw so many like uh, TikTok videos where they're like, thrillers you need to watch. And it was Shutter Island. And so many of the comments were like, wait, what's the name of this movie? <gasps> oh, it's so shocked. So today... It's just a different generation. Right? Yeah, it's like a different generation. We're talking about Shutter Island. If you've already seen the movie, maybe stick around because we are also making Oreo mochis. Okay, this is going to be delicious. And so first things first. 20 grams of Oreos. Am I tempted to do 40 and double the recipe? Absolutely. Am I not going to? No, because I have some self-control. Bro, how is six Oreos 76 grams? Are you kidding? It's two Oreos. That is ridiculous. Then you're gonna wanna crush up the Oreos, which I'm gonna fast forward this so that my audio listeners don't go crazy. Let me be right back. Hey, keep these away from me. I know. Dangerous, wow. Hand it to me. <laughs> So anyway, the best way to describe Shutter Island is to not describe it at all. We're just gonna jump right into it. And I think for the first two thirds of this entire video, you're gonna be fucking confused. I don't know how else to describe it. You're going to be confused. It's gonna feel like the worst movie that you've ever listened to until, until it hits you, okay? Do you know how to get to Boston Harbor Islands? You probably don't know. It's not really like a picturesque island with topless beachgoers hanging out by the shores. I know, I know, it's disappointing, but before you click out, let me explain. The journey to the islands is not easy. You can only get there by boat. And the waters are rocky. It's almost as if the waters are telling you, warning you not to come because this island is getting weird. So Teddy Daniels, otherwise known as Edward Daniels, he's on the boat and Maybe it's the nerves or the waves, but something is getting to Teddy. It's unclear, but he's hacking up a storm in the boat bathroom, like Not a good start if you ask me. Teddy's trying to hype himself up. He's looking into that shaky bathroom mirror of the boat, talking to himself. He's like, come on, pull yourself together, Teddy. Also, Teddy is Leonardo DiCaprio, just saying. Pull yourself together, Teddy. It's just water, lots of water, a lot of, And then he starts retching again. The guy has a thing for seasickness, I guess, okay? I love this movie for their vibes because all of the guys are in those long detective trench coats, the fedoras, and the the energy is just immaculate. Now, Teddy makes his way up to the docks where he's met with the partner, Chuck. So Teddy and Chuck are both detectives. They work for the federal U.S. Marshal's office, and they've been partnered for this case, this case that they're going to tackle on the island. Now, Chuck says he's from Seattle, but he's heard all about Teddy. Teddy's kind of a god in the detective world. He's quite literally the man, the myth, the legend, you know? So they start trying to get to know each other, and, you know, they're getting to the island, and as they're standing dangerously close to the docks, the skies are like this thick, foggy gray color, the kind that's so thick that you can't even see what's in front of you. You can't even see if the island is even coming closer and closer because the fog is that intense. You look like you're boating directly through a cotton candy cloud, and it's not pleasant. It's unsettling. But these detectives... Everything that they're handling is unsettling, so they're used to it. Chuck says, So you married? You got a girl at home waiting or something? I was married. Teddy was married. You know how um, they say two opposites are perfect? That was kind of Teddy and his wife. Teddy was the very serious detective, the one that comes home after handling all these mysteries and crimes and he likes to sit in the corner and like look out the window, right? And the first little preview that we get a flashback of his wife, she's this happy-go-lucky lovely woman who would pick out the most colorful ties for Teddy to wear to work. Like I'm talking pink and green, strawberry kiwi colored ties that she's putting this full-on detective in. She always seems so giggly, but Teddy's like, she died. Jesus, uh, I I didn't know. I'm I'm sorry. Don't worry about it. There was a fire at the apartment building while I was at work, and four people died. It was the smoke that got her, not the fire. He starts reaching around in his... Fuck. Where are my cigarettes? Where are my... I swear I had them before we got on the... And Chuck offers him his own cigarettes, and they start smoking it up together. And they're talking. 
Do you know anything about what we're about to do? Have you heard anything about this place? Did you get a briefing on the institution? Chuck says all he knows about this place really is that it's a mental hospital. And Teddy's like, yeah, for the criminally insane. So they're investigating a case on an island, and the only thing on the island, and this is not Hawaii, this is freaking Rikers Island. It's like a, it's a mental hospital for the criminally insane, and that's it. And you see the island come into view through the fog, and the island looks just as scary as it sounds. It seems like one of those places where like, okay, now I know why nobody goes on vacation here. That's it. Just criminally insane people. It's scary. There's no easy shores, just this big mountain with cliffs that head straight down into rocky waters. There's no sand. There's no cute little beach. There's only one dock on or off the whole island. That's it. And it's like this island is just attracting storms and clouds. It's covered in storms all the time. I would not be barefoot nor tanning casually on this island. The rain and the mist makes it look even spookier. And I, I don't know what's worse, honestly. Let's just say, just to scratch curiosity's sake, okay? Let's say something were to happen on this island. Let's say someone would get loose, per se. It seems like the worst type of place to find that person. It's giving Agatha Christie vibes all the way. So Chuck and Teddy are told by the captain, when we dock on shore, we need you to hurry and get the fuck off. They're like, why? What's the rush? And the, the captain is like, well, the storm's coming and we need to get the hell out of town. So we're just abandoning you and we're leaving. We're you turning back immediately. We don't want to get caught here. That's unsettling. The detectives are just being plopped into the middle of this mysterious island with no way out, no backup. I mean, can you see how things are going to go? They're not going to go great. So when they dock, the detectives get off the boat and they're met with the deputy warden, which is like the second dude in charge. And he's impressed by Teddy. He's never met a deputy marshal before and he says, well, welcome to Shutter Island. I'll be the one taking you up to Ashcliff. That's where we house the prisoners. And even as Teddy and Chuck are being escorted up to the island, to the mental hospital, there are guards with full-on assault rifles just staring them down. They're holding the, the freaking guns so firmly up to their chest. They look like they're in a war right now. This is not a welcoming environment, nor is this a good sign. So Teddy's in the little, little car and he says, Your boys seem on edge, boss. What's going on, warden? Yeah. Right now we all are. They start driving up the thick forest onto a tiny dirt road up to the mental hospital. There's broken signs everywhere. It seems like the hospital at one point might have been a place where people genuinely wanted to send people to reform. Maybe it was well funded at one point. Maybe there was a lot of money put into it. Maybe a few good people genuinely thought this was a good idea. But now? Now it literally was a horror movie. It did not look good. It looked like the good days were gone. And it was all about keeping the people in for as long as possible. That is the vibe this place is giving. I'm talking rusty metal, barbed wire. The fences are electric, so if you touch it, you're getting shocked. And Chuck is impressed. He leans over and he whispers to Teddy. How do you know it's electric fences? How can you tell? I've uh, seen something like it before. Oh. Interesting. They get to this big brick wall where this giant iron gate just open up only to reveal another heavily guarded gate which gets opened up. It's almost like a man trap. So they have to open one gate, you walk in, completely close it, then the inside gate gets open. Security is tight around here. The inside is actually kind of cute, like the campus of a very fancy private institution, like a college. The warden gives them a super quick tour and it goes like this. Red, red brick building on your right, that's the male ward. We call it ward A. Red brick building on your left, that's the female ward. We call it ward B. And that concrete building over there, ward C. That, that's reserved for the most dangerous patients. They're all housed there. You cannot get into ward C without the written consent and physical presence of both myself and the doctor, Dr. Kali. Is that understood? And Teddy smirks and says, You act like this insanity is contagious here. <laughs> You're funny, huh? Anyway, you are hereby required to surrender your firearms right now. What? Warden, with all due respect, we are federal marshals. We are required to carry them at all times. The warden's not having it. He starts listing codes about how when federal agents are inside of a penitentiary, the authorities of that prison have the final authority, so hand your guns over. 
So with much resentment, Teddy and Chuck, they give up their firearms. And it definitely seems like Teddy is the one that's calling the shots with him and Chuck. Like, he is the detective that gets more respect. He's the detective that more people know about. He seems like the big boss. Chuck even calls him boss. He's like, what's the move, boss? What are we doing, boss, right? So that's kind of the vibe. Now that that's out the way, the warden wants to go find the doctor for them to talk to. And I'm assuming new, fresh things don't happen all the time in the mental hospital for the criminally insane. So as the detectives start walking through the grounds, all the patients are outside, are ugly eyes on the two detectives the whole time. I mean, they're smiling at them in a creepy way. Some of them are sweeping the outside floors and you just hear the jingle, jingle of their ankle bracelets as they sweep. So Warden, uh, when did she escape? The prisoner. Sorry, I'm afraid it's protocol for Dr. Crawley to fill you in on the situation. You know you'll like him. He's really done something unique here. Really created a place for people that nobody else has. He treats them pa like patients, not the criminally insane, you know? You really have to talk to him about it. Teddy's tuning him out, and he sees a man frozen while picking flowers from the garden. Literally frozen. And then the man turns to stare at them. And another woman who's balding, she has little wisps of hair. She looks frail and old. She was in the process of trying to pick a flower in slow motion, it seems. But then she sees Teddy pass by and she looks up at him and she goes, Shh. and puts her finger up to her lips. Her eyes are creepy. Her eyes look like she hasn't slept in days. Like she's been forced to see things that she never wanted to see. She never blinks even while she's staring at Teddy. But she does give him her best smile to reveal a mouth full of rotting teeth. And when they get inside the building, it doesn't help that everything looks like they're in cages. Literally, even to get to the front desk, you have to open up another cage, and then another cage door, and another cage door. I mean, every single thing is in boxed in cages. The nurses are wearing those old traditional nursing outfits with the hats, you know what I'm talking about? It's stark white uniforms. There's no scrubs in here. The guards are stationed everywhere. The building itself honestly could have been beautiful. There are stained glass windows adorning the walls, a very pretty Victorian antique feel to it minus the cages of course and the guards and the criminally insane that is but you get the idea the warden is still going on and on and on about how dr crawley is the best of the best you know he's talked to um mi5 came here to talk to scotland yard i heard the cia once interviewed him why w what do you mean why uh i mean why what do intelligence agencies want to consult a psychiatrist about <laughs> i guess you have to ask him yourself and into the library, the study of Dr. Crawley we go. More stained glass windows. The walls are adorned with old books. Everything is that rich mahogany wood color. Normally, this would have been a pretty, pretty place. Like, but, you know, not so much, considering that there are people that probably want to kill you inside of this very building. There's old bronze statues littered throughout the room and the most peculiar artwork on the walls. For example, there's this one painting of a woman strapped to a chair with a box over her head. Teddy can't help but look at it. Dr. Crawley walks in and notices, and he tells Teddy, you know the paintings are quite accurate. The patients that used to be here before, they were shackled. They were rotting in their own filth. They were beaten bloody. They drove screws into their brains, drowned them in ice water until they passed out. It's like they thought that they could beat the crazy out of them. And now, we treat them. We try to heal and try to kill the psychosis, and if that fails, at least we provide them a measure of comfort in their lives some calm. Doctor, these are violent defenders, right? They've all hurt people, killed people in their lives? Yes, in almost all cases, yes. Then personally, Doctor, I say screw their sense of calm. Well, it is my job to treat my patients, not their victims. It's not my job to judge. Yeah, well. So anyway, this female prisoner, patient, this female patient, Rachel Solando escaped, what, 24 hours ago? Well, she escaped last night between 10 p.m. and midnight. And uh, is she considered dangerous, Doc? You could say that. Um, she's killed all three of her children. She drowned them out by the lake behind her house. Took them out there one by one and drowned them in the water. Held their heads under until they couldn't breathe no more. Then she brought them back inside. Arranged them at the dining table. Ate a meal with her dead kids. A neighbor stopped by before and figured out what was going on. They called the police. Teddy is like, but what about the husband? 
he died in war. She's a war widow. She starved herself when she first came here, and she insisted that her children were not dead. Teddy gets a picture of the woman and asks for an aspirin. Oh, detective, are you prone to headaches? Not usually. I think it's seasickness today. Shall I continue then? Rachel still believes that her children are alive. She also believes that this is her home in the Berkshire. You're kidding me, right, Doc? You're kidding. Never once for the past two years that she's been here did she ever once acknowledge that she was in an institution. She always made it seem like we were all <laughs> delivery workers or postal workers. It sustains the illusion that her children never died. So her brain created this elaborate fictional story and she gives us all parts to play in her little fictional story. Okay, we'll have you search the grounds for her. Yes, indeed. The warden and the men, they searched the entire grounds and not a trace of her. But for me, for me, detective, it was more puzzling how she got out in the first place. The room that she's in, we lock all the doors from the outside and the windows are barred. It's like she evaporated straight in through the walls. Okay. It's clear to Teddy and Chuck that they are in over their heads. So their first order of business is to investigate Rachel's room because how do you just evaporate through the walls? There must be some sort of tunnel that they don't know that she must have been digging up with a spoon. Like I'm talking prison break, right? But when they get there, nothing seems broken. There is no tunnel, there is no unusual circumstances, nothing. She did not claw herself out the window. There is genuinely, this is like the mystery of the room where they have no idea how she slipped out. And Teddy's like, I mean, Doc, being in this room right now, there is no way she didn't know the truth. <laughs> there is no way that she didn't know that she's in a mental institution. I mean, it seems like something you would notice from time to time. I mean, look around. The bars on the window, the one lone door she can't get through. This bed is janky. Like, come on. Well, detective, sanity is not a choice. You can't just choose to get over it and get with the program. Chuck notices that in the closet in the room, there are two pairs of shoes. And another employee had told Chuck that each patient only gets to keep two pairs of shoes. So he looks over at the doc and he's like, so you're telling me, doc, she left here barefoot? Come on, doc. She couldn't get 10 yards in that type of terrain with no shoes. Uh, we're going to try to add more milk and eggs because this consistency is not okay. It's, a, it's like cement. Like, I think I could build a building with this type of consistency. This is not edible. <laughs> So Teddy also notices that under the bed, there's a piece of flooring that looks just not quite right. He lifts it up and the piece of wood plops open. No tunnel though, it's just a folded up piece of yellowed paper. He picks it up and gingerly opens it and it reads, the law of four. Who is 67? And the doctor says, oh, well, that is definitely her handwriting, but I have no idea what the law of four is. So doc, you think it's some random scribbling? Oh no, not at all. Rachel is smart, brilliant in fact. The paper could be important. Yeah, okay. Well, Doc, we're gonna need to get all the files of all the nurses, the guards, the orderlies, anyone who was working when Rachel went missing. Okay, well, I will take your request under consideration. Doc, this ain't a request. A dangerous prisoner, patient, a dangerous patient has escaped. You will comply. Detective, all I can say is that I will assemble all the staff in the common room after dinner and you can ask your questions then. So till then, it seems like Chuck and Teddy are on their own, right? They go out to check the surroundings of the creepy building and it's not looking good for Rachel. It's 11 miles to the nearest island off of this island, okay? Off of Shutter Island. And the water is freezing. If she went into the water last night, she, she would have drowned. She would have been crushed by the rocks or frozen to death in the water and her body would have been washed back up onto the shore of Shutter Island because of the tide. Teddy notices a lighthouse. Now this lighthouse isn't necessarily on the island. It's almost like you have to get into the water. It's right next to the island on like another mound of rocks. So he notices it and he's like, what's in there? And the warden says it's sewage facilities and there's no way that she's up there. They already checked. Huh sewage facilities. So after dinner, Teddy starts questioning the orderlies and they all claim they were at their post that night, but they didn't see anything strange. And Teddy's just not having it. Someone here is lying. There's no way that nobody saw Rachel. One of the guards fesses up that he did leave his post for like two seconds, 0.2 seconds to go use the restroom. Sure, it goes against protocol, but he really had to pee and Rachel should have been there when he got back. There's no way that she could have even gotten out of her room. It's not like the guard was like, let me go pee, but let me unlock her room first. So Teddy's like, okay, let's back up, okay? Everybody back up, calm down, everyone. 
Did anything strange happen the day when she went missing? Well, she had her group therapy session. Okay, anything unusual happened during that nurse? The nurse is like, well, define unusual. This is a mental ward for the criminally insane. Everything is quite unusual. But no, nothing unusual. Rachel didn't behave differently. She was just worried about the rain and the storm. And she complained about the food again. She complains all the time about the food, constantly. And then the nurse brings up the fact that Rachel was do talking to Dr. Sheehan that morning, which is her primary psychiatrist at the facility. So the detectives are like, okay, then let us talk to Dr. Sheehan. And Dr. Crawley says, oh, well, you can't, because he's left on the ferry this morning. He's had a long planned vacation, so nothing was going to stop him from leaving. You're telling us that a dangerous patient escaped. We are in a state of total lockdown, and you let her primary doctor leave on vacation? And Dr. Crawley's like, well, yeah, of course. He's a doctor, not a patient. He can leave whenever he wants. The detectives try to reach out to Dr. Sheehan by the phone, but because of the storm, all the phones are down on the island, and the rain is just coming down hard. The feeling is that nothing really feels for sure. Like, everything just feels dangerous. You know, a patient escaped, everybody's on edge, but at the same time, all of the employees seem somewhat calm. It's the weirdest thing. It seems like Dr. Crawley doesn't even want the detectives to find Rachel. He seems evasive, like he's hiding something about her. Nobody's really helping the freaking detectives. It's frustrating. Maybe it's the lightning. Maybe it's the freaking storm. It's driving everybody crazy, putting everyone in a funk. But overall, really weird shit. When is the last time you asked yourself, hey, that piece of plastic in my pocket, is it even doing anything for me? Because with the secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card, you can start building credit with everyday purchases and on-time payments. That is the magic of Credit Builder. You can increase your credit history with no annual fees or interest, and having a higher credit score can mean getting better car loan rates, renting apartments easier, or just bragging rights at the dinner table. So continue your credit journey with Chime. Sign up takes only two minutes and doesn't affect your credit score. Get started at chime.com slash Baking. That's chime.com slash baking. The Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card is issued by Stride Bank NA, pursuant to a license from Visa USA. Chime checking accounts and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply for the secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card. Regular on time payment history can have a positive impact on your credit score. Impact to score may vary, and some user scores may not improve. So, Dr. Crawley, the most Jennifer generous host ever, he invites the detectives over to his house, which is a mansion on the island, okay? I'm talking wood staircase. Everything is that rich cherry wood color. It feels like the type of house that you only ever see in movies, but nobody ever really lives there anymore. Everything is dimly lit. There's no recess lighting. Everything is covered in shadows from the fireplace lighting. It's just crackling away. There's red velvet curtains. You can already picture the house. Teddy's like, wow, quite the house you got, Doc. We must be in the wrong field. Oh, it's an old house constructed during the Civil War. We come, meet my other colleague. This is Dr. Jeremiah. And we get introduced to an even older doctor, older than Dr. Crawley, Dr. Jeremiah. He, ooh, that <laughs> looks like something I get at Home Depot, honey. That looks like some, um, what do you call that, grout? <laughs> you know, when you, in between the tiles, you put the cement? So uh, Dr. Jeremiah is sitting on this red armchair facing the fireplace, drinking his whiskey, and immediately he takes a liking, can I call it that? He, he starts reading the two detectives. You know, men like you are my specialty. What's that supposed to mean, Doc? Men of violence are my specialty. And Chuck laughs, trying to break up the awkward tension. Well, <laughs> that's one hell of an assumption to make, right, Teddy? <laughs> No, no, men, sorry, it's not an assumption at all. You misunderstand me. I said you are men of violence. I'm not accusing you of being violent men. It's quite different. Okay, let's hear you out, Doc. Come on, read us. Well, you both served overseas. Yeah, well, that's not much of a stretch for all you know. We are paper pushers over there during the war. No, you were not. You had big jobs in the war. And as Dr. Jeremiah is telling them about their own past, we get flashbacks to Teddy's previous war days. And it's brutal. It's violent. He fought in World War II, and he was out there fighting against the Nazis. And there is some weird tension throughout the room. And we find out it's because, you know, like I said, Teddy fought in World War II, and he could clearly see through Dr. Jeremiah's accent. And he believed that Dr. Jeremiah was a Nazi. 
and that obviously causes some tension. So obviously that causes some tension. But then add to that that Dr. Jeremiah flat out refuses to hand over the staff files, saying that the board of directors for the hospital has rejected the request. This sends Teddy into quite the rage. I mean, rightfully so. I mean, the whole time he's been here, it just feels off. Like nobody really wants to help the guy. So the two detectives, they rush out in anger, go to their quarters in the orderly building to sleep. And they're trying to fall asleep on these old rusty bunk beds, but it's just not comfortable. They've got this giant window next to them and the rain is coming down, just pitter plattering onto the window. And it's, it's not a pleasant one. And Teddy tells Chuck, we're packing up our shit and taking the ferry out in the morning. What? Boss, are you sure? It's just, I've never really quit something before. It feels wrong. Yeah, well, Chuck, we haven't heard the truth once since we got here. You don't think that's weird? Listen, Rachel Solando didn't slip out of a locked cell barefoot without any help. I think she had a lot of help. Maybe Crawley is sitting up in his mansion right now, pre rethinking his attitude once we leave. So, you're bluffing about leaving, or you actually want to leave? I didn't really say that. Listen, the guy is like talking in code, okay? He's saying that he wants to leave, but he doesn't really want to leave. He just wants to act like he wants to leave so that Dr. Crawley will rethink everything and maybe be a little bit more useful in the investigation. And with that, Teddy tries to fall asleep, but he's plagued with flashbacks of his wife. We get a lot of flashbacks throughout this movie of his wife and his pre-war days and his wartime days. It's a lot. And in this one, he's back in his apartment Everything is decorated in this beautiful green shade, like an emerald green. Green doors, green wallpaper. Now what's interesting in these flashbacks is you see bits of ash raining down inside the apartment. So I think that's maybe his trauma colliding with his flashbacks of how his wife burned to death in the apartment. Yeah, you know, nothing's on fire in the dream though. And um, you know, his beautiful blonde wife looks like she belongs in a magazine cover. But this time she's not smiling. She's not happy. She's yelling at him. How many of these liquor bottles are you hiding, huh? Are you even sober anymore? Listen, you don't get it. I killed a lot of people in war. I need that to help me. And then his wife is suddenly smiling. She's still here, Teddy. Who? Rachel. She never left. And then the wife walks over to the window. Remember when we stayed in the cabin in the summer, Teddy? Oh, we were so happy. But now she's here. And you can't leave. And his wife turns around to look out the window and her entire back is on fire. She's literally turning to ash. And Teddy comes up and tries to hug her. And he says, I'm never leaving you. I love you so much. And she says, Teddy, I'm just some bones in a box. No, no, you're not. You're more than that. You have to wake up, Teddy. I'm not here anymore. You have to face that. But Rachel's still here. And so is he. Who, who, who's here? Latest. And with that, the room starts to fill with more and more smoke. The furniture is now on fire. It's ablaze and his wife turns to ash in his arms. But when he looks down, instead of holding crumbles of ash in his hands, it's water. There's water flowing through his fingers. Listen, it's like a fever dream, okay? This is why this movie is so complicated for the first two thirds because you feel like you're high. You're like, none of this even makes sense. These flashbacks don't even make sense but it will all make sense. And with that, he jumps awake from his nightmare. And it's like his wife told him to stay on the job because he needs to find Rachel. That's kind of the vibe that we're getting. So he's determined he's gonna find Rachel for his wife. The next day, the detectives, they're gonna talk to everyone that was in Rachel's group therapy session and they start going through the patient records. Okay, I guess we're talking to uh, Peter Green. And they sit in the cafeteria in front of a Peter Green. Let me see his file. And Chuck and Teddy are talking to each other. Assaulted a nurse with a piece of glass. She survived, but her face is permanently disfigured. Yikes. Can't wait. <laughs> Peter walks into the room, and he seems normal. Till he starts talking. She was nice. She would always smile at me. But you could see it in her eyes. She liked to be naked. She liked to suck. And then she asked me if she could get me a glass of water. Are you kidding it was obvious. She wanted me to pull out my thing so she could laugh at it. Okay. Peter, we need to ask you some questions about Rachel, okay? When I cut her, she screamed. And she scared me. What did she expect? Okay. Uh, we're talking about Rachel here. Rachel Solando. Rachel. <laughs> Rachel drowned her kid. She's fucking sick. This sick fucking world we live in. 
She should be gassed. They should all be gassed. The killers, the R words, the insert racial slurs, the insert homophobic slurs. We should gas the bitch. How do you kill your own kid, huh? <laughs> okay. Now Teddy's getting pissed. He's like, yeah, well, that nurse. Maybe she had kids, huh? Maybe her husband was trying to make ends meet, trying to have a normal life. But according to your file, you tore her face off. So congratulations. That nurse will never be normal again. Do you know what that nurse was afraid of? Huh? You. And this leads Peter Green into a full-on losing his sh fiasco. He tries to attack Teddy from across the table. So now, now when interviewing the rest of the patients, the detectives have a table full of nurses with their sedative syringes ready to go like three <laughs> tables down, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so that's great. Real welcoming. The next woman to come and sit down. She's a real smoker, just smoking cigarettes back to back. I'm not sure when I'll ever get out of here. I probably shouldn't get out of here. And Teddy says, You know, excuse me for saying this, Miss Kearns? Kearns? Mrs. Kearns. Right, well, I don't want to offend you, but you seem really normal. Well, yeah, I have my dark days, though. I suppose everybody does. The only difference is most people don't kill their husbands with an axe on their dark days. <gasps> there it is. Killed your husband with an axe. All right, noted. Although personally, I think if a man beats you and fucks half the woman that he sees and nobody's going to help you, axing him isn't really the worst thing in the world. Okay, well, Mrs. Garns, maybe you could get out one day. I don't know what I would do if I did. The world is very different now. Apparently they say there's bombs out there. Bombs that can reduce whole cities to ash. And then TVs, voices, and faces coming from a box. <laughs> I hear enough voices already. I don't need that. Okay, Miss Gerns, what can you tell us about Rachel? Not much. She believed her kids were still alive. She was still living at home. She thought that we were all the neighbors or the milkman or the postman. The group therapy session was about anger the day that she escaped. Tell me about this uh, Dr. Sheehan. What's he like? He's uh, okay, nice. Not hard on the eyes, as my mother would say. Did he ever make a pass at you? Oh, God, no, no. No, Dr. Sheehan is a good doctor. He would never. And she turns to Chuck for a glass of water. And he gets up and gets her one. And she grabs Teddy's notebook and scribbles something before giving it back to him. We don't see what it says, but we see that he looks petrified and puts it into his coat pocket. And it's this weird moment. And it almost makes you question Chuck or something because why won't he show it to Chuck? He hides it before Chuck gets back. Teddy says, I just have one more question for you, Mrs. Cairns. Did you ever meet a patient named Andrew Latis? No, never heard of him. And she gets up. But she looks like she's on the brink of tears. Like she's running out the minute that he mentions Andrew Latis. So Teddy is suspicious. And he tells Chuck, did you see that? She was coached. She used the same words as the doctor and the nurse as if she was told exactly what to say. But Chuck's not having it with his conspiracies. He looks at Teddy and he's like, Who's Andrew Latis? You asked all the patients about him. Who the hell is he? He was the maintenance man in the apartment building where my wife and I lived. He was also a fire bug, obsessed with fire. Andrew Latis lit the match that caused the fire that killed my wife, and he got away with it. He disappeared, and then a year ago, I see him front page on the paper, the ugly son of a bitch. He burned down a schoolhouse and killed two people. He said the voices told him to do it. First, he went to prison. Then he was transferred here. Okay, then what? Then nothing. It's like he vanished. It doesn't look like he's in Ward B, so that must mean he's in, what, Ward C? I mean, or he could be dead. Yeah, so could Rachel Solando, for that matter. But there's only one place nobody would really notice if you were to hide here. And where's that? And he looks over at the lighthouse. Now, first they want to go to the cemetery, okay? They need to go investigate more before they go on to the lighthouse because the lighthouse is like covered in water. You can't even really get there, so I don't think that that's the plan, right? They need to find an excuse to get there. The cemetery that they get to, they're reading the headstones and just having a conversation. And Chuck is saying, you know that patient that axed her husband? She said something to you when I got up to get water, didn't she? So you're like, holy shit, what did she write, right? And Teddy says, no. Come on, don't lie to me. We're partners in this. She didn't say it. She wrote it. And he whips out the notebook. And there, scribbled aggressively. Like, you know when you write something on a piece of paper, it, like, makes the indents? It just said, 
R U N. Run. So Chuck keeps asking, well, if Latus is here, what are you gonna do? I'm not gonna kill him, if that's what you're wondering. <laughs> well, if he killed my wife, I would kill him twice. I'm not judging you. And since they're opening up, Teddy starts telling him about his war days and how he has PTSD. How he remembers seeing so many bodies on the ground covered in snow. Too many bodies to even count. Too many to even imagine the sheer magnitude of how many lives were taken during the war. He said that the troops lined up the guards from one of the camps that the Nazis were running. And um, we took their guns. Someone shot one bullet. They, the guards were acting out, and we were just going to shoot one bullet to calm them down. But then we all started shooting. And we couldn't stop. We killed all the Nazi guards. It wasn't warfare. It was murder. They were lined up. We took their weapons, and we killed them all. You know? That's why I'm not here to kill Latus. I'm done. I've had enough killing. Okay, so what is this all about if you're not going to kill him? Well, after he came here and he vanished, I started doing some checking up on this place. A lot of people know about this place, but nobody wants to talk about it. It's like they're scared or something. You know this place is funded by a special grant? They conduct experiments on the mind here. Or at least that's my guess. Wait, you think they're running some weird experiments here? Like I said, it's my guess. And nobody would talk about it. Till I found a guy that was a patient here before. His name was George Noyce. Nice kid. Socialist. He gets offered money to do a psych study. But during that psych study, he starts seeing dragons everywhere, beats up his professor nearly to death, ends up here in Ashcliff, Ward C. They release him after one year, and what does he do? Two weeks into freedom, walks into a bar, stabs three men to death. Stands up in the courtroom, begs the judge for the electric chair, anything, anything but the mental hospital, anything but Ashcliff. Judge gives him life in prison. A and you went to go talk to him? Yeah, but he's a mess. But it's pretty clear from what he's telling me. They're experimenting on them here. It's worse than prison. Yeah, but I don't know, boss. How do you believe a crazy guy like that? But isn't that perfect, Chuck? That's the beauty of it. Crazy people talk. Nobody listens. I mean, I saw in war what human beings are capable of doing to each other. I fought a war to stop shit like this. And now we find out that it could be happening here on our soil. These experiments. So what are you really here to do, boss? I'm gonna get proof. I'm gonna go, get proof, get back, and blow the lid off this place. What? That doesn't make sense, though. Wait. Think about it, boss. You're telling me you've been waiting to learn more about this place, and then suddenly this place needs U.S. Marshals? Yeah, I got lucky. There was a patient escape, which is perfect, you know, because I get to come here, I get to investigate, but it's an excuse. I'm not here to investigate Rachel Solandis. I'm not even here to investigate Andrew Latus. I'm here to blow the lid off this place. No, 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 boss. Luck doesn't work like that. The world doesn't work like that. They got an electric fence around a septic tank lighthouse. Ward C is inside a civil world war fort. Everything about this place stinks of government ops. What if they wanted you here? What? Bullshit, Chuck. You were asking questions. We came here for Rachel Solando. Do we even have a shred of evidence that she even existed? What? There's no way they could have known that I would be assigned to this. Bullshit. They were looking into you while you were looking into them, and now we're here. Well, you're saying this is all a setup? You're saying I was looking into this place, so they stationed me here to look into Rachel Solando? Oh, no. Starker than I thought. We gotta get off this goddamn island. You and me, we gotta get out. But you and I both know that's not gonna work. The storm is turning into a hurricane. The facilities are going into a super lockdown. Even the detectives have their clothes drenched in rainwater and have to change into those white orderly gowns that the employees are wearing instead of, you know, their fancy suit and tie and trench coats. The doctors are having meetings about what to do. They're all lined up in this very expensive looking room. Well, everyone in Ward C needs to be placed in manual restraints. Dr. Crawley doesn't agree. He says, if the facility floods, they will all drown and you know that. Yeah, but that would take a lot of flooding, Doctor. We're on an island in the middle of a hurricane. Flooding seems rather reasonable. That's 24 human beings if they die. Are you going to be okay with it? Dr. Jeremiah says, listen, if we could manually shackle the other 42 patients in Ward B and A, I would do it in a heartbeat. 
So we're picking up that maybe, maybe Dr. Crawley is the only good doctor here, regardless of how weird and evasive he seems to be. He seems to be the only type of doctor that really genuinely wants to help these patients in a way that's not just drugging them up or, I don't know, lobotomizing them. But Teddy is picking something else up. He's listening to this, and his eyes are darting across the room. The note. The note. Dr. Crawley, the note. You just said 24 patients in Ward C. 42 patients in the others. That's a total of 66 patients. Okay, detective, where are you going with this? Well, that seems to be what Rachel Solando is suggesting. Who is 67? You must have a 67th patient here. What? What are you, what are you talking about? 67th patient? No. And besides, what are you even doing here? Did the warden not tell you the good news? What good news? Rachel has been found. Safe and sound. What? The fuck? So they take the detect- Literally, it feels like a fever dream. This, dr this whole movie feels like a- What? So they take the detectives to see Rachel in her cell, and her feet are- Well, she's not wearing shoes, but there's not a single mark on her feet. You don't think that's interesting? She left her two shoes behind in her room, and she escaped, and she was barefoot, but there's no scars on her feet. And Rachel says, Doctor, who are these men? Why are they in my house? Rachel, these men are police officers, and they have a few questions. Teddy leans down and says, Rachel, we're looking for a known terrorist. If you could help us, um, letting us know what you did yesterday, that would help us a lot in putting two and two together. Oh my god. Here? In the Berkshire? In this neighborhood? <sighs> Terrifying. Well, I made breakfast for Jim and the children, and I packed his lunch, sent the children off to school, and then, um, I decided to take a long swim in the lake outside. I see. And after that? Um, after that? <laughs> and Rachel gets up into his face and says, I thought of you. And he's like, okay, I'm sorry, ma'am. I don't know what you mean by that. And she says, don't you know? How lonely I've been, Jim. So she's out here thinking Teddy is her dead husband. So that's great. Okay. And she's like, you're gone all the time. Because you're dead. And I cry every night. How am I supposed to survive? And then she hugs Teddy. Who hugs her back really intimately. And I'm like, whoa, Teddy, you're doing a lot. And he's like patting her hair. And I don't know. Maybe he just has like a weak spot for unhinged behavior. Because he's like, it's okay. But suddenly she flips a switch and pulls back and her eyes are all crazy and she goes, I buried you. I buried you. So who the f*** are you? <laughs> You're in my house now. And she starts freaking out, trying to attack him, and Dr. Crawley has to sedate her and the detectives are rushed out of the room. Dr. Crawley tells Teddy that they found Rachel by the shore skipping rocks. And back in Dr. Crawley's office, we see Teddy completely lose himself. He starts having these crazy migraines, and it might have to do with the flashes of light, of the lightning, are so bright inside of the office, like literally blinding. And he's hunched over on the recliner, and he's just trying to gag and throw up. And Chuck is freaking out, like, what's wrong with him, Doc? What's wrong with him? He's having a migraine. Have you ever had one of those? Imagine someone sawed open your head and took out the contents and shook it as hard as they could, making a little brain smoothie. Here, take these pills, detect detectives. They will stop the pain. You need to lie down. And Teddy feels like his head is about to explode, so he gets escorted to this giant room that has now been converted into rows and rows and rows of hospital beds. It's the room that all the hospital staff are going to be in while they prep for the storm. So they're taking cover in this room. Teddy lays down, and he makes eye contact with a super evil-looking dude. Apparently, he's the real warden of this place. So the other guy is like the second in charge, deputy warden, right? Anyway, Teddy concludes the warden looks like a real dick. And as he's slipping away into sleep, he's right back into the war, staring at the dead bodies in the snow. And he sees a family buried in ice. And as he walks around, he takes a second look. And there's a mom, Rachel, and the kids. The kids are alive but dead in the snow. One of them wakes up. And she starts whispering to Teddy, you should have saved me. You should have saved all of us. Then he goes on to dream, a dream that I can confidently say sounds like the worst dream of my life. He runs into Andrew Latis, the guy that killed his wife, and he lights Teddy's cigarette for him. 
And the guy looks terrifying. He's got this giant scar running down the length of his face. He's got glass eyeball in one of his eyes. And Chuck comes in. He says, we're running out of time. We're running out of time. And then all of a sudden, there's a scream. Like, it's literally a fever dream. There's a scream. Teddy looks over, and Rachel is covered in blood, calmly standing in her housewife clothes. She says, do you think you could give me a hand? And underneath her are the three bloody bodies of her children. Teddy walks over, leans down, and picks up one of the kids, who proceeds to say, I'm dead. And he says, I'm so sorry. Why didn't you save me? I tried, but by the time I got here, it's too late. And the two walk the kids over to the lake and calmly put them in the water. Rachel looks over at Teddy and creepily says, See? Aren't they beautiful? And with that, Teddy snaps awake. But he's still not in reality, because his wife is standing in front of him, drenched in water. And he literally says, Why you all wet, baby? Latus isn't dead. He's still here. He isn't gone and he isn't dead. And you need to kill him, Teddy. And then she leaves. And now Teddy wakes up. Not from his dream, but because of the commotion and the sirens. They're raging. The backup generators have failed. Security needs to be sent to Ward A and Ward B. The patients are being forced to different wards to be manually restrained. I mean, this is an actual show. This is the worst case scenario. And Teddy looks at Chuck and says, You think the whole electrical system is fried? That means the fence, the gates, the doors, everything's not working. Are you thinking what I'm thinking, boss? Nice day for a stroll, then. Maybe to perhaps Ward C? Maybe Andrew Latus is there. So when they get to Ward C, they run into a random guard who thinks that they're just orderlies because they're in the orderly clothes. And he says, hey, you guys new here? If you see any one of those buggers loose, don't try to restrain them yourselves. They're going to kill you. Those fuckers will kill you, you understand? So go on, get your asses in there. We need all the hands on deck. And they walk through an empty looking abandoned building and water is seeping through the ceilings. The place is leaking. The cage doors are all open. Security doors, but you get it. They look like cage doors. Ooh. Let me check. Oh, honey, I think we got an issue. <laughs> they are not supposed to crack like. Mm, I don't even know if we should try eating it. I guess we have to, but. It's supposed to be a mochi ball. They look like a seashell. Um, okay, so you supposed to use mochi flour, not tapioca flour. But not even edible. I'm kind of sad I wasted two whole Oreos on it. Shut up. Genuine. I yeah. might. So the cage doors are all open. Uh, you get it, security doors. The lights are flickering off and on, and you just hear these distant screams of patients and prisoners, and it's the last place that I would want to be, but they're going in there willingly. Teddy says, Latus is here. I can feel him. And out of nowhere, a naked man runs up to Teddy, and he's got this crazy look in his eyes. And he touches him and goes, tag, you're it. <laughs> and starts running off through the labyrinth maze-like structure of just brick walls. It is like an underground tunnel, but out of a horror movie. Literally hell. Hell itself, okay? Teddy starts running after him, and he feels like he's got to go find this guy. But the guy disappears. And when he's gone... Teddy's looking around. And then all of a sudden, he's being strangled from behind. And the guy says, listen, listen to me. Listen to me right now. I'm not trying to leave, okay? Why would I want to leave? Why would anyone want to leave? We've heard what goes on in the outside world. The H-bombs. You know how the H-bombs work? Hydrogen. And Chuck comes in screaming for Teddy. And it gives Teddy enough ample opportunity to gain the upper hand and free himself of the patient. But instead of just running or restraining the patient, Teddy starts punching him and strangling him. And another guard runs in hearing the commotion and he's confused. He's like, what the fuck? We said catch them, not kill them. And he escorts the guy out and asks for Chuck's help, but he doesn't want Teddy to come. He wants Teddy to cool off and take a walk. So our guy Teddy is alone in Ward C, where he starts hearing the whispers of someone whispering, ladies, ladies, but we can't see them. He finds the area where all the prisoners are locked up and the lights are getting so dark he has to light matches to get through the cells. He sees patients chained up, naked, dancing. Some of them are using their own blood to paint the walls. Some of them are trying to grab at him through the cells. And finally, he gets to Latus. Hmm. Let me see your face, Latus. The guy is hunched over and he says, you lied to me. You lied to me. It's always been about you and Latus. And when the man in the cell jumps up towards said Teddy, we see it's not Latus from his dreams. It's George Noyce. The guy that helped Teddy find out what was going on in the mental hospital. 
the hell? How are you here? You can't be here. There's scars all over his face. Who, who did this to you, George? Who? You like who is it? George? The guy that he interviewed before he got to the island. And George says, you like it? You did it. I'm back in here because of you. What? Uh, however this happened, I'll fix it. I will never get out of here. You can get out once, never twice. How did they get you, George? You don't get it. There's no investigating. You ain't investigating anything. You're a rat in a maze, a fucking rat in a maze right now. All of this, they did it for you. G George, George, no. You're wrong. Really? You've been alone since you got here, right? No, I, I'm with my partner. You've never worked with that partner, have you? No, but he's a U.S. Marshal. Answer the question, have you ever worked with him, have you? George, I know people. I trust this man. You trust him? Then they've already won. Then George starts crying about how they're going to take him into the lighthouse and cut into his brain, all because of Teddy. And Teddy promises to get him out of here. And he runs back to join Chuck, who he doesn't trust anymore because... Remember what George just said? So he abandons Chuck and starts heading for the lighthouse by himself. That's where George told him latest would be. But I mean, the only way to get there is pretty much off the steep rocky cliff. Like you literally have to jump down and then into the water and then to the lighthouse. So he gives up halfway because it's like a suicide mission. He finds Chuck. Well, he tries to find Chuck, but it looks like Chuck jumped off. Jumped off where? The cliff. There's a cigarette on the ground and he sees um, someone in an orderly outfit on the bottom. So he starts trying to traverse down to see if it is Chuck, and it's not. It's someone else. Someone else is dead. So now he has to climb back up, but he has no idea where Chuck is. But as he's climbing back up, he enters this random cave. There's this little cave indent in the walls and a fire. And inside, it's Rachel. Rachel Salandis. What is she doing here? And Teddy sits down and says, Rachel, what are you doing here? Can I ask you something, Rachel? Did you really kill all your children? She looks at him. <laughs> I never had children. I was never married. Before I was a patient here, I used to work here. You were a nurse here? I was a doctor, Marshall. Do you think I'm crazy? Even if I say I'm not crazy, that's not going to help, will it? Once you're declared insane, anything you do is declared inside of that insanity. So what happened? I started asking questions about our shipments of drugs, a lot of drugs being shipped into this facility. And I started asking about, about the surgeries. Have you ever heard of a transorbital lobotomy? They shock the patient with electricity and then they go through the eye with an ice pick, pull out some nerve fibers, makes the patient more obedient. But it's despicable. Let me ask you, detective. Do you know how the pain enters the body? No. Well, it's not through the flesh, that's what everyone believes, it's actually through the brain. The brain controls everything. Fear, empathy, sleep, hunger, anger, everything. What if you could control it? Control it? You mean the brain? Recreate the brain, but make it so that all is gone. Make it so that a man has no fears, no pain, no memories, nothing to confess. What? You can never take away a man's memory. No, maybe you can't, but they're creating ghosts. They're creating ghosts out here. They're creating these little ghost armies to go out there and do whatever is told them. Ghosts of men, ghosts of people with no memories, no pain, nothing. What? There's no way that would take years. Yeah, it did take years, detective. Years and hundreds of patients experimented on. Exactly. 50 years from now, people will look back and say, this, this is where it all began. No, they won't. Do you understand, detective? You're not leaving. I I'm a federal marshal. They can't stop me. And I was an esteemed psychiatrist from a respected family, and it didn't matter because I'm crazy now. Let me ask you, any past traumas in your life? Yeah, uh, why? Because they're going to use some event in your past as a reason why you lost your sanity. So when you, they commit you as a patient, your friends, your colleagues, they'll all say, of course they cracked. Who wouldn't have after everything that they've been through? What? They could say that about anyone, though. Yeah, well, they're going to say it about you, detective. How's your head? Any funny dreams, trouble sleeping, headaches? I, I, I'm prone to migraines. Have you taken any pills? Please, God, tell me you didn't take their pills. I took their aspirin. Oh, my God. You've been drinking their drinks, eating their food, taking their pills. Have you at least been smoking your own cigarettes? No, no, I, I haven't. It takes 48 hours for the narcotics to reach your bloodstream. First, your, finger tricks will, your fingertips will feel numb. Then you won't feel your whole hands. Do you see anything scary in your nightmares recently? What? Okay, wait, wait, what goes on in the lighthouse? Tell me. Brain surgery. 
The kind where they split you open and they just start poking around to see what happens. That's where they create the ghost. Well, who knows about this on the island? Everyone. The nurses, the orderlies, they can't possibly... Everyone. Teddy falls asleep for a while before being kicked out by Rachel. She wants him to leave because, you know, she can't be seen. She won't be here when he comes back. She finds a new place on the island every single night. And there's no way off the island except for the ferry. And they control it. And Teddy turns to leave, but he first asks, I was here with a friend. Have you seen him? He disappeared yesterday. Rachel looks at him and says, Marshall, you have no friends here. Meaning Chuck is not a friend. And with that, Teddy leaves the cave where he was with Rachel and starts making his journey back. He's on edge now. I mean, clearly he gets picked up by the warden and it looks like an army van, honestly. It's like one of those forest tractors. And the warden's like taking a leisurely stroll, were we? You enjoy God's latest gift? What? The violence of the storm. You enjoy it? God loves violence, you know that? I haven't noticed. Sure you have. Why else would there be so much violence? He gave us violence to wage in his honor. Well, I wouldn't know I'm not that violent, Warden. You are. I know this because you're as violent as they come, and I'm just like you. And the Warden drops him back off at the staff quarters, but before letting him go, he says, If I were to sink my teeth into your eye right now, would you be able to stop me before I blinded you? You can try, Warden. That's the spirit. Get out of my car. So now, Teddy gets off the car and goes to meet with Dr. Crawley, and he says... Good to see you, detective. Glad you're safe after the storm. Excited to be heading back now that Rachel has been found? Anyway, bit of a big day with big meetings. Someone went into Ward C yesterday and subdued a patient. And had a long talk with one of the most dangerous patients in there, George Noyce. Dangerous? Yes, quite. He's quite dangerous, delusional, and likes to play mind games with people. Last week, he got a patient so riled up they got into a fight. Anyway, would you like a smoke before you get on the ferry? Oh, um, no. I'm good. I will be taking the next ferry out. We will be. We? Yeah, speaking of we, have you seen my uh, partner, Doc? Partner? Marshall, you don't have a partner. You came here completely alone. And he lights his cigar, and the doctor says, So tell me again about your partner. And Teddy says, What partner? So it feels like a trick. If he says his partner, Chuck, then he might be accused of losing his mind and being delusional, so he goes along with it. What partner? What? I came completely alone. So now, now Teddy is certain that he has to do something about this place. They're messing with people. So he takes a sedative syringe and goes and finds Dr. Jeremiah. He sticks him with it and then sets an entire car on fire to create a distraction. He decides he has to make it over to the lighthouse because that's where Chuck probably is. And Chuck is perfect for their experiments. So he, he has war experience, he has detective knowledge, he has combat skills. He starts running through the woods, the bushes, the trees, climbing walls. I mean, really parkouring it out here through the place and makes it into the cold water. He starts swimming against the tide to get into the dark, looming lighthouse that is heavily guarded. Knocks out one of the guards, grabs his gun breaks through the fence and into the lighthouse wooden door. And he starts climbing the long spiral staircase. And he opens a door. Chuck, he's not there. Opens a door. Chuck is still not there. In fact, there's no doctors, patients, or any surgical tools, just empty doors. Opens another door. Each room, each floor that he goes through, there's just completely empty rooms. Till he reaches the last door. And he kicks it open, and it's Dr. Crawley sitting on a desk in the middle of the room with a tape recorder playing. Why are you all wet, baby? Dr. Crawley asks Teddy, why are you all wet, baby? Remember Teddy asked his wife, why are you all wet, baby? Uh-huh, yeah. Teddy says, what did you just say? You heard me, detective. By the way, the rifle is empty. Come, have a seat. Also, how badly did you hurt the guard? Dr. Crawley gets on the phone and tells someone to check up on the guard. You blew up my car. Detective, I really love that car. How are the hallucinations? Uh, not bad. Dr. Rachel told me about the drugs, that you guys are drugging us. Oh, she did? When was this? I found her, Dr. Crawley. I found Dr. Rachel by the cave on the cliffs. You will never find her. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt that I'll never find her, considering she's not real. What the f*** are you saying, Doc? You're having withdrawal. I haven't had a sip of alcohol since long before I got on the island. Yes, because it's not alcohol withdrawal, it's the meds. I'm usually not a fan, you know, but I have to say in your case, um, chloropromazine, you've been on it for the past two years. Oh yeah, so for the past two years you've been slipping me drugs in Boston, is that it? Not Boston. Here. You've been here for two years. As a patient, 
of this institution. All right. After everything I've seen, you're really going to convince me that I'm crazy, okay? Do you know the kind of people that I deal with on a daily basis as a U.S. Marshal, for God's sake? You were a U.S. Marshal. You are the 67th patient of this place. Here, take a look at your form. And he snatches the paper from Dr. Crawley and he starts reading. The patient is highly intelligent, highly delusional, decorated army veteran, former U.S. Marshal, shows no remorse for his crime because he denies the crime ever took place. Highly developed, fantastical narratives which precludes facing the truth of his actions. Teddy crumbles up the piece of paper. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this bullshit. Where is Chuck? Where is he, huh? Let's try another way. The doctor walks over to a board with a blanket and he rips off the board and there's four names. Edward Daniels, Andrew Latis, Rachel Solando, and Dolores Chanel. Anything these four names have in common? It's the rule of four. What do you see? Focus. The names. The names. The names have the same letters. The names are anagrams for each other. They are the same letters for the words Andrew Daniels as for Andrew Latis, Rachel Solando, and Dolores Channel. Wait, what? Is this rearranged? Rearranged. Doc, your tactics are not going to work on me, okay? You wanted the truth, right? Well, here it is. Your name is Andrew Latis. You are the 67th patient here. You are the 67th patient. You were put here by court order 24 months ago. You committed a terrible, terrible crime. One that you cannot forgive yourself for. So you invented another self. Edward, a.k.a. Teddy Daniels. What? You've created a story where you're not a murderer. You're still a U.S. Marshal, still a hero in your story. You are here to investigate for your job, your hero job, and you've conveniently uncovered a conspiracy so that anything we say to tell you about the truth about who you really are, well, you can chalk it up to lies. My name is Teddy, Edward Daniels. Oh, God, right. And your partner and Rachel, yes, I've been hearing this fantasy for two years now. I know every detail. I've been here through your dreams that you have every night. Your missing partner, you may or may not have killed the guards during the war. I wish I could let you just live in your fantasy world, but you are violent, trained, and dangerous. You are the most dangerous patient that we have. You've injured orderlies, guards, other patients. Two weeks ago, you attacked George Noyce. What? Bullshit. Give me one reason I would even touch him. Because he called you latest. And you would do anything not to be latest. This is a transcript of the conversation that you had with George yesterday. He said, this is all about you and latest. It's all that it's ever been about. Exactly. He just said, me and latest. When you asked him what happened to his face, he said, you did this. No, no. He meant it as it's my fault that he's here. You almost killed him. You almost killed him, Andrew. And we decided that unless we do something about it, to bring you back to reality, there will be permanent measures that will be taken to ensure that you never hurt someone again. What? They will lobotomize you, Andrew. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. If I don't play along here, you guys are going to turn me into one of those fucking ghosts. What about my partner, huh? You're going to tell the U.S. Marshal's office that both of our desserts are just gone? And in that moment, in walks Chuck. Huh? What is going on here? Chuck, are you working for them? Sorry, boss. There wasn't another way. Someone had to stick to you to keep you safe, you know? Who the hell are you? Don't you recognize me, Andrew? Been your primary psychiatrist for the past two years. I'm Lester Sheehan. Dr. Sheehan? What? I trusted you. I risked my life. I, I, I thought you fell from the cliff. I thought you, I, you died. I know, boss. We we're just running out of time. Dr. Crawley says. I've convinced the board that we would be able to bring you back. I convinced the board that if we could play out the most radical, cutting-edge role play to bring you back, I thought if we just let you play this one out, you would come to the answers yourselves and you would see how much it doesn't make sense, Andrew. You would see how untrue it was, how impossible this story was. Andrew, listen to us. If we fail with you, everything we've done here will be discredited. We are on the front lines of a war, old boy. We're trying to fix people without lobotomies, without meds. We are the front lines. And Teddy looks pensive, and he's sitting there taking us all in. He's nodding. And then he jumps up, grabs the pistol from the desk, and starts pointing it at them. Get back. My name is Edward Daniels. Are you sure that's your gun? Yes. Then go on, shoot it. And he shoots it. It's a toy gun. What have you done? It's a toy, Andrew. 
Listen to us. Dolores was manic suicidal, okay? You just couldn't stay away. You ignored what everyone told you. You ignored the signs. You moved into that lake house after she purposefully set your city apartment on fire. Andrew, look at your children. Henry, Simon, this little girl, look at these pictures. The one that you would dream of every night. The one that tells you you should have saved her. Are you going to deny that your daughter was real? Her name was Rachel. These were your kids by your wife. And your wife drowned them by the lake, Andrew. What? Will you ever deny that your daughter lived? And Andrew starts reaching for the photos, crying. And he sees his wife, who is soaking wet in the corner of the room. She keeps saying, I'm sorry. I told you not to come here. I told you it wouldn't end well, she says. And then we get a flashback. Andrew comes home after a long day of work, and he thought the lake house would help his wife, who was suicidal and delusional. He finds Dolores sitting out near the lake on her swing chair. Dolores? And he says, why are you all wet, baby? Dolores starts making out with him instead. I missed you. I want to go home. And we will, Dolores. Where are the kids? They're in school. Honey, it's Saturday. School's not open today. Where are the kids? Well, my school is. And Andrew looks over to the lake, and he sees three kids floating in the water. They were all his, and they were dead. He tries to perform CPR while Dolores watches from the lakeside, and then he calmly gets them out one by one and lays them on the grass, side by side, posing their hands on their tummies, and he kisses them one by one. He tries to massage their feet to bring them back to life. Meanwhile, Dolores is losing her mind. She sits on his lap and says, Let's just take them back to the table, honey. We can change their clothes and dry them off and have dinner. And tomorrow we can take them on a picnic. They can be like our living dolls. He says, If you ever loved me, Dolores, stop talking. I love you. I love you so much. I just wanted to be free. And while she's rambling about how much she loves him, he grabs his gun and he shoots her. And she falls right next to the kids. And there you have it. All four of his whole family on the ground in a row, dead. And then when Andrew wakes up from his flashback, he's tied up to his dead bed, screaming, Rachel, surrounded by Dr. Crawley and Dr. Sheehan. Rachel who? Rachel Latis, my daughter. Why are you here? Because I killed my wife. And why did you do that? Because she murdered our children. Who's Teddy Daniels? He doesn't exist and neither does... Rachel Salanda, I made them up. Why? We need to hear you say it. Because Dolores told me she had an insect in her brain and she could feel it inside of her skull and she told me that and I didn't listen and I loved her so much and I trusted her and then she... she killed the kids. Why did you make up these characters? Because I can't live knowing Dolores killed our children and I... I killed them because I couldn't... I didn't get her any help. I killed them, really, I did. Here's our fear, Andrew. We've been through this nine months ago. We had a breakthrough. And then you regressed. I don't remember that. You reset, Andrew, like a tape playing over and over and over again on an endless loop. So we need to make sure that you've accepted reality this time. I've accepted it. You tried to help me when no one else would. Listen, my name is Andrew Latis, and I murdered my wife two years ago. Okay. Good. So now they just have to prove to the board that this worked, right? So Andrew is sitting on the ward steps and Dr. Sheehan walks up, smoking a cigarette, and he offers him one. Andrew Latis takes it. And uh, Andrew Latis says, so what's our next move? Dr. Sheehan says, you tell me. He looks around and he says, we get off this rock chuck. We get back to the mainland because whatever is going on here is bad. He's back into the loop? Well, it's up for debate. And then we see uh, Dr. Sheehan, Chuck, whisper something to Dr. Crawley, and they all look disappointed. And Teddy says, don't worry, Chuck. They won't get us. That's right, because we're too smart for them, aren't we? Yeah, we are, aren't we? You know this place makes me wonder, Chuck. Yeah, what's that, boss? To live as a monster or die as a good man? And with that, Teddy gets up and walks with the orderlies. We're going to take him to be lobotomized. The doctors know that Teddy remembers he is Andrew. To live as a monster or die as a good man. He's choosing to die as Teddy, then live as Andrew. Ah. And that is Shutter Island. 
and there's so many parts of this movie that are crazy so for the when they first get there onto the island you know the guards have their guards or the guns up yeah. and he says oh you guys are all on edge and he says right now we all are because he is one of the most dangerous criminals on the island uh, so of course the guards are on edge when he's so yes. it was a giant role play yes when he's asking about Andrew Latest to all of these people, you know, they're kind of losing their minds. And that woman almost cries because maybe she feels sympathy. I think at the end, the doctors felt so much sympathy. Like, technically, he was kind of this war hero, this U.S. Marshal. All he ever did was try to do good in the world, serve the country, and then his wife killed all their kids. And he killed his wife. So it's almost like they're coming from a place of almost sympathy. And I think that's why so much of the story feels like a fake detective novel. For example, you know, the note, and then when he gets to the doctor's office, he's like, who is 67, the rule of four? You know, these are all very, it's all, even the way that it's acted, the doctors are acting really weird. Mm -hmm. They're like, anyway, Rachel's been found. It doesn't feel like a real mystery of who the hell is Rachel. Mm -hmm. Wow, so he... Yeah, he was lobotomized. Wow. Listen, one of the best movies of all time. I don't even know what to say. If you haven't watched it, go watch it because it's so good. And then we can just be mind in the comments together. But I hope you guys enjoyed this week's BAM. And make sure to stay tuned for the next BAM coming to you on a Monday. Probably the next Monday. Bye.